and take it away, TJ. Well, thank you very much, Liz. Um, I think you look wonderful and uh, don't worry about <laughs> being pale at all. It's oh no, nice. it's source of pride. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to see everybody, especially some old friends. And uh, I was really hoping we could go in person tonight, but it, it wasn't to be. But I think soon, soon we'll be able to get together and uh, talk about our heroes and our, our, uh, our wonderful history that we have in Derry. It is, is indeed my pleasure this evening to give you a presentation on, on one of my heroes and uh, the pride of Derry, in my opinion, uh, the great and wonderful uh, General John Stark, um, born right here in Derry in 1728, about four miles away from where I'm sitting right now. I think his surname uh, fits his personality and his physical appearance to a T. It's almost as if his name was bestowed upon him by someone like Charles Dickens. He was a spare, sinewy man uh, with piercing blue eyes and a large nose. His biographer describes him as a maverick. He was difficult, touchy, and cantankerous. He had a tongue that could clip a hedge. He didn't suffer fools gladly, and this was especially true of fools in the political class. One wonders um, if he came to life today or in the recent years and uh, what he would make of the current political scene. I'm sure we'd be in for some tart uh, retrospective. In any event, he uh, served a very brutal uh, apprenticeship under Robert Rogers during the absolutely pitiless uh, French and Indian War. In the follow-on Revolutionary War, his actions on the battlefields of Breed's Hill and Bennington were of tactical uh, in nature, but carried strategic implications. If the nascent Revolutionary or Continental Army was cut off and overrun on Breed's Hill, uh, the revolution would have been over before it even started. If Bennington ended in defeat, uh, there would probably have been no Saratoga. And if Saratoga didn't happen, there probably wouldn't have been the game-changing intervention uh, from France. Uh, perhaps his achievements uh, don't merit national prominence, but here in the Granite State, he certainly uh, must rate as a hero, as a, as a titan. And as we move forward, I'm going to explore uh, whether he's always seen in that light. Um, we'll begin here up on Route, 112, Route 28, uh, where the historical marker is. So far, so good. It's in the parking lot of the Bridgeway Church. And if there are any parishioners from that, that fine church here tonight, thank you very much. Uh, the sign is always in good repair. There's no trash ever thrown around it. So thank you for preserving our cultural heritage. Uh, the facts of his life are, are laid out here. Uh, we're going to focus uh, on Fort uh, Ticonderoga, or the Carillon, as it was known, uh, during the battle in which uh, Stark fought. And we're also going to take a deep dive into Bennington. This uh, next section, this next slide, is, is dedicated to Liz. And I know she's going to be wanting to jump in, but, but save it to the end, Liz, OK? Save it to the end. <laughs> So in, in my mind, and I, and I think in a lot of people's mind, uh, Stark is, is perceived as uh, maybe somewhat of a, a sepia man, um, a relic of a long forgotten era that perhaps is perceived as a, a vehicle for wholesome Disney productions. Uh, over on the right there, uh, you can see some buckskin clad figures. Uh, it could be Fess Parker on the set of Davy Crockett. Um, he didn't fare much better in, in the larger Hollywood in King Vidor's uh, Technicolor Extravaganza Northwest Passage uh, featuring uh, Spencer Tracy. Uh, the costumes were made by a protege of Edith Head and they're very outlandish and it looks almost as if Robin Hood and his merry men were transplanted uh, to the wilds of upstate New York. And before I leave this slide, I just want to mention 
that the ruffles on General Stark's shirt have nothing uh, in comparison to the ruffle shirt I wore to my senior prom uh, in the late 70s. <laughs> but um, be that as it to me, <laughs> moving on. I'm happy to report that contemporary artists have really uh, done a magnificent job in realistically portraying just the absolute brutality, both of the fighters poised against each other and the weather, which was just absolutely horrible. And if anybody has seen The Revenant, uh, which is actually set sometime after uh, Stark's time, it's set roughly between the War of 1812 and the Mexican-American War, but the, the main characters are still there. Um, and this movie just goes uh, so well to portraying the reality of the battlefields uh, in, in the 1750s where, where Stark uh, fought. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Another very realistic uh, portrayal some of you may remember Mel Gibson's vehicle from, uh, oh boy, I guess it's 20 years back now, The Patriot. And uh, just the whistling arrow comes out from the woods and then a tomahawk cleaves a skull in two and, and off we go. And that's really what it was. Not uh, the sepia-toned quaint prints that, well, are in the Derry History Museum. It's more like this. I spoke of, uh, Stark's legacy um, in the opening, if you will. And uh, they just uh, appear here again. Um, and of course, uh, the famous motto, live free or die, death is not the worst of evils. Um, he uttered that back in 1809. He was uh, invited to a reunion of his old soldiers. He was unable to attend. He uh, had severe rheumatoid arthritis, which uh, was a legacy of the French and Indian War, and was unable to make the journey. Um, New Hampshire adopted the motto in 1945. And uh, on the outside, it, it looks like, you know, geez, why 1945? I mean, uh, the war was almost over, or the war was, would end. Um, but after four years, in 1945, the people in New Hampshire were very, very tired. They, they were exhausted, you know, sons, fathers, brothers were off to war. They signed up for the duration. And the closer we got to the Rhine River, the more ferocious the battles became and the longer the casualty list. And the same was true over in the Pacific. The closer we got to mainland Japan, the more brutal the battles. You think of Okinawa and Iwo Jima, people were exhausted. They had had enough. They wanted it to be over. Is this a familiar theme for anybody else here? <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's why at that time, uh, you know, the leadership in the state decided to, to adopt that motto. And uh, I think uh, they made a good decision. So we saw earlier the road marker. We now are very, very familiar with the motto on our license plate. But has our honor and our um, respect for Stark, you know, has it been seen through all the time? Has it been sustained? Well, this next slide may give us some pause. Yeah, okay. So in the run up to the bicentennial, the booze industry was quick to capitalize on his image, um, to sell Jim Beam. I am one of the mind that Scotch, going down is like bourbon coming up. Not a fan. I prefer a nice Irish whiskey. But um, I wonder how Stark would have thought uh, to see his image uh, used in this way commercially. Um, and I, I certainly, I'm, I, I'm not a fan. And then, oh, the humanity. Look what our very own state has done. Yes, there's a John Stark bobblehead. Big Poppy, yes. John Stark, no, no. Oh, the dignity, you know, I just don't know. <laughs> um, 
let's move on from the, <laughs> this tawdry commercialism. Up next is a Funko Pop figure. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know that uh, even stalwart historians like Ray and Eleanor have, have a limit, so I'm not going to go any further in this direction. <laughs> Some facts um, and a look at the virtues of self-reliance. So Stark was born here to Archibald and Eleanor Stark. Uh, Archibald was a Scot who had migrated to the province of Ulster. And there he met uh, his wife, Eleanor, who was a, a Presbyterian Scot who had been living there. They migrated uh, very early on. And their life and the life of John himself, I think, brings to mind uh, the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who said that life was nasty, brutish, and short, because that's what life was like. Uh, Archibald and Eleanor left Northern Ireland with three children. They didn't live. They died on the journey of smallpox. You can see there that Stark moved to Derryfield, which we, we know as Manchester, at age eight. That's because his house burnt to the ground in Derry. So it was a very, very rough and brutal, you know, place. Uh, you know, it was, it was hard. Manchester, believe it or not, was, was still on uh, somewhat of a frontier of, of, of the colonies. And he did go hunting, trapping, fishing. And crucially, uh, he made uh, a friendship with a, a baptized uh, Abenaki, uh, who we know as Christo. And they got along uh, so well. And, and I think this relationship was life-saving because Christo taught Stark a lot about the culture of the First Nation, of, of the Native Americans. And as we'll see, this maybe saved his life because on an unsanctioned hunting uh, trip where he knowingly and willingly with his colonies entered, uh, our colleagues entered into Indian territory where uh, at one point they had amassed over 700 beaver pelts. They were caught uh, by the, the Abenakis. Actually, the name of the warrior was uh, Francis Tadagawa. And um, you know, Stark uh, was in the woods and he heard a hissing sound, a hissing sound like that made by a rattlesnake. And he turned around and there was Francis Tadagawa. And the image you see over there on the left is, is very accurate. Uh, you can see that the warrior's head is completely shaven except for a top knot, which was festooned uh, with feathers and other decorations. Uh, their nose was pierced. Uh, they would pierce their earlobes and tie them to the shoulders. I think sometimes young people today practice, it's called gauging maybe. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was no deep woods off invented back then. So the warriors, as they moved through the woods, uh, before moving through the woods, would smear themselves with raccoon grease or bear grease uh, to keep the mosquitoes down. And on a war party, uh, they completely blackened their faces, except for the forehead, uh, which they colored uh, blood red. So it was terrifying, you know, to come up across uh, these proud warriors in the woods. And soon after he was seized and transported uh, to San Francois, um, up in the Canadian border, um, he was made to run a gauntlet. But Stark, knowing something of the Nabanaki culture, refused to run the gauntlet. As a matter of fact, he took the club from the first guy in the gauntlet and started handing out beings of his own, which was joyfully received by the Indians. They thought that was a riot. Uh, later on, they gave him a hoe and they put him in the field with the women to plant corn. And he threw the hoe in the river and said, I refuse to do woman's work again. The warriors just thought that was fantastic. They loved it. Um, ultimately, uh, Stark is ransomed, as you see there, uh, for 103 uh, Spanish dollars and brought home uh, with a much deeper 
understanding of the Abenaki, uh, which would serve him well in the next phase of his, phase of his life in the, in the French and Indian War. I uh, paid a visit uh, not too long ago to the Buttonwoods Museum over in Haverhill, and I was talking with the, the curator there, and I said, well, what's your favorite epic of history? And he said, the F&I. And I was uh, rather taken aback, and I said, geez, what's this guy get against the letter I? And he goes, no, the F&I, the French and Indian <laughs> War. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here, uh, as I stated from the outset, uh, was just a brutal conflict. Um, Stark enlists with Rogers Rangers um, as a private soldier. Uh, through his aptitude and leadership ability, he is given a commission. And upon promotion to captain, is given command of a company. Uh, we're going to talk about the disastrous battle of the Carillon better known to us today as Fort Ticonderoga here in a few minutes. Uh, the Battle of the Snowshoes, uh, just an epic, epic clash. And Stark didn't take place in the, in the actual expedition itself, uh, but he did lead the relief party. And just very shortly, uh, Robert Rogers and his band struck way north and inflicted a grievous loss on the French and Indians. However, on the way back, Stark had to break his own rule and take the same route in, uh, uh, same route out that he followed in. This was a big no-no because sure enough, when he followed his own path out, an ambush was laid that um, laid his successful raiding party to waste and he barely survived and, you know, was able to get, you know, the few remaining rangers back where they were met gratefully by Stark, who had food and warm clothes and was able to offer comfort to this unit that had been devastated. In a pattern that we'll see in the next conflict in which he takes part, um, after the war, he gets out of the army and he goes home and he starts being a farmer again. Uh, Rogers Rangers uh, were the prototypical special operations units uh, that we see and hear of and are so proud of uh, today. And for the U.S. Army Rangers, uh, a lot of their doctrine uh, still draws heavily on that laid out by Rogers Rangers uh, so many years ago. Um, you see the, uh, the wonderful illustration there of one of Rogers Rangers by Don Troiani, who, in my opinion, is, is probably America's foremost artist, a military artist. And for those who uh, share my enthusiasm of Troiani, there's now uh, an exhibit of his paintings of uh, 17th and 18th century soldiers on display at the Museum of the American Revolution down in Philadelphia. And that goes through September 22nd. And uh, I'm hoping um, you know, to make that trip. Uh, before I leave this slide, you know, I've, I've talked about the brutality of warfare, but the other uh, thing that we must contend with was just sickness and starvation. Um, I mentioned that Stark had three siblings who we never met, who, who perished of small parks on the journey to the new world. And Stark himself was laid low by smallpox uh, during the French and Indian War. Uh, spots, you know, red spots appear on the tongue and throat. Uh, this turns into a rash uh, that spreads to the face, to the throat, to the hands, to the extremities. Uh, the rash um, develops bumps. The bumps turn into postules that are as hard as buckshot and fever ensues. And if you live and emerge from the feeder, fever, the postules fall off, leaving these hideous scars. And um, it just was a devastating disease. And Stark was able to survive. Many of his peers did not. Another uh, problem was scurvy, uh, vitamin deficiency, not having you know, access to fresh fruits and vegetables during their long forays 
uh, into the into the woods, and this led to gums becoming soft and teeth falling out. Uh, so it was really, you know, a, a very very difficult and brutal time. And you know, here I am, you know, just struggling to get the intestinal fortitude up to get up in the morning and scrape my windshield on a cold February morning. And I didn't have to like walk to Concord and then walk to Albany and then walk to the French border uh, like the Rangers did. Uh, they also used the novel approach of skating to war, skating along uh, Lake George. And um, in the spring and summer, they would get into whale boats and they'd have to portage these whale boats um, over rapids. So um, really uh, just um, an incredible period of history. I think one that's probably understudied and this is especially true of the casualty counts, because as you read of, you know, Rogers forays up north, I mean, hundreds of rangers were lost. And I don't think there's an accurate count out there yet. And I'd be interested in when we move to the discussion, if, if, if people have better information on that. Uh, let's see if I can, there we go. So, uh, I spoke earlier of the, of the Battle of the Carillon. Uh, Carillon is uh, a, a French word uh, that means bell. And when you look at maps uh, of, of the fortress, uh, Fort Ticonderoga, uh, from above, it does you know, look like a bell. Um, and in this, this fight, <laughs> as you can see there, 16,000 16, British troops and provincial soldiers are handily defeated by 4,000 French and Indians. And uh, the, the 42nd, the Highland Regiment, the famous Highland Regiment, I mean, two thirds are, are left on the battlefield. And I think, and this is just a personal opinion, is this made a huge impression on Stark. And I think the message was, you know, do not allow yourself to be subordinated subordinated, you know, to an incompetent commander. And we'll, we'll explore that, that theme uh, a little bit more as we move on. Uh, here is a map. Um, and you can see over in the left-hand side under the Union Jack is uh, how the British forces were arrayed. And you can see the fort uh, there on the shores of Lake Champlain. And you're like, well, how come, uh, what, what's, what's with the fortifications? So the French, uh, decided to defend forward. Uh, they knew where the British were going to attack from, and they decided to uh, dig a series of trenches, and they uh, protected these trenches with abati, uh, which are uh, trees that are chopped down, and the branches are sharpened, and they're pointed in the direction of the, uh, the enemy line of march. And they were observed um, you can see Rattlestake Mountain there down at the bottom. Uh, a young British engineer observed the trenches being dug, but he just did not understand the extent of the trenches because the French did a very good job of camouflaging these positions uh, with cut down uh, pine boughs. So the length and um, breadth of the French positions was vastly underreported, thus giving uh, the British poor intelligence with which to make their plan. But as they moved on the fort, uh, two key things happened. Uh, the commander in chief of the British forces, Lord Abercrombie, was very much a lead from behind, orchestrate from behind kind of leader. And he depended on a subordinate, uh, George Howe, uh, to be the man up front, ensuring that his orders were being carried out. And as it turns out, very early in the battle, Howe was killed in action, uh, thus depriving Abercrombie of uh, his man on the ground. Abercrombie specifically told the tactical commanders, you know, you will mass and you will attack together. You will attack together. Once Howe is killed, that plan is, goes to the wayside and the tactical commanders uh, put their forces in piecemeal, and consequently, they are defeated piecemeal and um, just given a, a tremendous loss. And 
I think the takeaway for, for Stark was, you know, you, you just cannot allow yourself to be put into a position, you know, like that. Um, so a grievous loss um, for the British. Um, eventually, they would take the fort toward the, the end of the war. And uh, during the revolution, uh, it would be taken again uh, by the Green Mountain Boys, who will feature it in our story. And if you're just like looking at the map, sitting there like, geez, maybe they should have came up behind the fort, maybe crossed across Lake Champlain and hit them from there. Well, that's what happened in the, in the revolution. So moving on uh, to the revolution and the run-up to the revolution, we heard earlier that Stark, after the, the F and I, <laughs> uh, moved back uh, to his farm uh, where he was happiest. But he did follow the political situation as things started heating up in the colonies. He attended the Committee of Safety meetings, as you can see there. And um, when war broke out, he was appointed colonel of the 1st New Hampshire. Um, he deployed the unit to Boston. There's a famous story of him, um, you know, as the troops moved from what we now know as Medford across a very narrow causeway uh, onto Breed's Hill, uh, Bunker Hill, um, they started taking fire and everybody around Stark started running and Stark would have none of it. He said, a well-rested man is worth 10 in combat. And he calmly walked under fire uh, and deployed his troops successfully as it were. And another thing that I think was a huge lesson learned from Stark was uh, he became intimately familiar with the British army. He was a de facto member of the British Army, even as a provincial officer, he was looked down upon by the regulars, uh, but he learned and he understood uh, the mindset of the British soldier and their command philosophy. And again, he was able to put this knowledge uh, to use in, in the revolution. And while we're not gonna dwell on the Battle of Bunker Hill uh, as much, uh, we will see how this comes into play at the Battle of Bennington. Perhaps naively, uh, Stark thought that his gallantry on the battlefield would earn him promotion. But in fact, uh, political generals who in, were nowhere near the battlefield were appointed uh, over him uh, to command. And he resigned and he went back to the farm. Uh, but as we'll see in a few minutes here, um, as the British started moving uh, through Vermont and New Hampshire became endangered, uh, Stark uh, rallied to the flag uh, one more time. Um, there's a great novel about uh, the Saratoga campaign. It's called Saratoga. It's by an author named David Garland. And in the novel, uh, Garland has uh, his Stark uh, mutter this phrase, which I think is awesome. And um, again, it just goes to show uh, Stark's knowledge of the men. And the full quote is, no army could survive long without a supply of rum. Politicians seem to think patriotism is a strong enough drink. Uh, but Stark uh, knew his men. He knew how to motivate his men. And that uh, ability, that knowledge of both his own soldiers, as well as the enemy soldiers, uh, came to the forefront at the Battle of Bennington. So it's very interesting, um, in the lead up to the Battle of Bennington, uh, Stark uh, is called forth uh, by the state of New Hampshire. State of New Hampshire at this point in 1777 is a new state. It's recently settled. It's very poor. But Stark, um, in a matter of days, is able to enlist 25 separate militia companies, numbering just over 1,000 men, which in effect was one in 10 men in New Hampshire 
signed up with Stark uh, to go to uh, Bennington. And it brings up another uh, point, uh, the perpetually resource starved George Washington can never get enough men and supplies from Congress or the states. And here, perhaps New Hampshire might have been sandbagging Congress and Washington, uh, having that many men kept back. And um, I learned in a visit to uh, uh, the Fort at number four in Charleston, New Hampshire, which uh, is rebuilt today. And it's a great, it's a great day trip. I would encourage anybody to go up there, especially on Mustard Day in August, where they um, reenact a Stark uh, moving to Fort, uh, the Fort at number four to prepare for the journey to Bennington. And the soldiers who arrived at Fort at number four, uh, prior to marching off to Bennington, were issued with 100 musket balls each and five pounds of powder. So just imagine that times a thousand. So the resources uh, that New Hampshire was husbanding, and it's a good thing they did, uh, because if uh, you know the British Army, you know uh, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, if he was successful in Vermont, why not go on to New Hampshire? Who was going to stop them? So maybe it was good that um, New Hampshire set aside a little bit <laughs> for its own. Um, as we see there, again, another, um, I, I don't want to say it fact, but it, it's generally understood that in the Revolutionary War, when militia were put up against Hessians or British regulars, they broke and fled just about every time, but not at Bennington, you know, and why, what was the difference? Um, and we see, as I mentioned also from the outset, the strategic implications um, of this victory, because the Battle of Bennington would allow for the successful uh, conclusion of the, the Saratoga campaign and the surrender of Burgoyne, which was probably instrumental in bringing the French into the war uh, on the side of the colonies. So strategic implications uh, from tactical actions. So a, a man full of pithy quotes utters another one. And um, in, the, in the, the phase, you know, as they get ready to cross the line of departure, um, there are a number of uh, versions of this uh, particular quote, but yonder the Hessians, they were bought for seven pounds and 10 pence a man. Are you worth more? Prove it. Tonight, the American flag floats from on the hill. Oh, Molly Stark sleeps a widow. Whoa! <laughs> I'm going. Let's go. <laughs> you know, uh, just uh, you know what a, uh, the ability. You know what what is going to make your guy? How are you going to get your soldiers fired up? You know how are you going to motivate them? You know, and um, he knew the buttons to push, and and he pushed them. So let's take a look at the battle. Again, we'll uh, we'll move to a map. And um, you'll see over on the right is Bennington. So Bennington, uh, the battle didn't take place at Bennington. Uh, Bennington was the objective of uh, Colonel Baum, uh, the Hessian leader and his column. There was a supply depot there and that was the objective of, uh, of Baum's march. And we see that um, Stark uh, deploys his force into three sections. So down uh, toward the bottom, you can see a force under Herrick. In the north, you can see a force under Nichols. And then in the center, uh, you have Hobart under Stark. Stark launches his forces simultaneously. He knows enough not to put his militia in line and march them into the teeth of the British defense, not gonna work with militia, not going to work. He has to be smart. He has a, uh, a very deep understanding of the regulars and the Hessians and how they fight. He does a triple envelopment. He positions his forces um, as deployed or as depicted here, and he sets them off at once altogether. 
So the Hessians are overwhelmed. There's firing to the front, there's firing to the north, there's firing to the south. Who's the main effort? Where are they coming from? Confusion is sown into the ranks of the regulars and they are overwhelmed. Stark does what no other continental leader can do. He takes militia up against the regulars and he wins. But as the Japanese say, at the moment of victory, tighten your chin strap because a relief column under Colonel Preyman is coming off from uh, the left there. And Stark and his boys are uh, in the consolidation and reorganization phase. Uh, they're victorious, but now their victory is teetering on the edge with the appearance of another uh, strong force. But uh, just in the nick of time, uh, the Green Mountain boys uh, show up and they're able to take on Bremen and uh, victory is assured. So uh, Stark just seems to have this knack of being in the right place in the right time uh, with the right force. And he carries the day uh, at Bennington. Um, here's a rather pithy uh, overview <laughs> uh, by a minister. And um, I just found this very interesting and forgive me for reading slides. I know that's a big no-no, but uh, this victory is thought by some to equal any that has happened during the present controversy. And as long as prudence, moderation, sobriety and valor of any estimation amongst the United States, it will not fail to endear General Stark to them. So I love it how the minister reduces the bloody battle to a con controversy. And uh, you can see um, how his vocation perhaps had uh, some influence on uh, what he thought um, were the soldierly uh, values uh, put forth uh, during that particular conference. I think one of the most um, fascinating artistic depictions of the battle is this one uh, by an African-American artist uh, by the name of Jacob Lawrence. Uh, he rose to prominence uh, during the Harlem Reson Reson uh, Renaissance, excuse me. Um, he's more well known uh, for a series of 60 panels uh, called the Great Migration or the Migration Series, uh, which depicted uh, the migration of African Americans from the rural South uh, to the urban North and the immediate aftermath of, of World War I. Uh, later in his career, uh, he set out on another uh, series of panels. Uh, this is from a 30 panel series uh, called uh, The Struggle uh, from the History of the American People. And he didn't name his, um, his, his panels uh, with titles. Instead, what he did is he would take a quote uh, relevant uh, to the, the subject depicted. And here, as you can see, he uses a quote from a Hessian. Again, the rebels um, rush furiously at our men. Um, he called his style uh, dynamic cubism. And uh, I, I just think that is... Uh, such a wonderful description of his style. And um, again, he pulls no punches. Um, the brutality of the fight is uh, depicted in all of its bloody gore. Uh, the two horses charging at him at each other just draws your eyes right to the center of the, of the painting. And the bayonets and the angular uh, depiction is just, just, just wonderful. But I think uh, the most poignant part of this particular uh, painting is seen down there in the lower right, uh, where you see the bloody hand of a fallen soldier clutching, you know, at his rifle. And I, I just think it's um, just a, a very, very interesting uh, take on, on the battle. And um, on another uh, artistic depiction, um, this one by an artist named uh, Leroy Williams. And um, interestingly enough, um, Leroy Williams was employed by um, the Works Progress Administration um, during the Depression, where um, 
you know, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was trying to put America to work uh, during the Depression. You, you may be familiar with the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, but he also funded artisans and artists. And the Bennington Museum uh, was the beneficiary of this painting uh, by Leroy Williams. This is just a detail, uh, but I include it here um, because here we see an African-American uh, soldier and uh, he's moving uh, prisoners, loyalist prisoners. And if you look very closely, that um, hempen contrivance um, around the, the necks of the prisoners is, is called a coffle. And that was the very device that um, slave owners used during that terrible period of our history to move slaves from market and then to the new owners, you know, after the sale was made. So an ironic uh, twist here. A recent scholarship has determined that uh, the only African-American soldier to fight in the battle that day uh, was killed. Um, and this, this scholarship didn't really surface until just uh, two years ago in 2019, uh, a researcher in Vermont, um, Phil Holland, uh, was closely scanning the records and he came across uh, the record of a soldier named uh, Sip Ives. And Sip is um, short for Scipio. And uh, Scipio uh, refers to the famous um, uh, Roman emperor Scipio Africanus, um, who was known for defeating Hannibal at the Battle of Zama in Africa. So uh, the names of uh, many um, slaves and, and free, free Blacks um, was often um, Scipio. And um, through that knowledge, uh, the researcher Phil Holland was, was able to determine that Sip Ives was in fact uh, an African-American soldier killed in battle. Uh, he was from a Massachusetts regiment um, and uh, the Massachusetts regiment uh, linked up with the Green Mountain Boys. Uh, Sip Ives um, originated from central Massachusetts, uh, Cheshire, uh, Mass, and uh, was wounded, uh, as it turns out, mortally. And, and died uh, the day after the battle. So um, I don't know if anybody on the call was able to, uh, to tune in last week to uh, Glenn uh, Knobloch's fantastic uh, presentation on New Hampshire's African-American soldiers, but uh, that was just a very, very well presented and well-researched uh, program. And um, I, I was happy to just add this little bit, um, you know, regarding the Battle of Bennington. Um, I was able to, uh, to visit Bennington uh, this past summer, and it's a gorgeous, gorgeous site. Um, there is the monument, um, again, not on the battlefield, but uh, on the site of the supply uh, depot that was the, the object of the, uh, the Hessian advance. And there's the site, you know, looking out toward the Green Mountains, um, you know, high atop the tower there, just absolutely wonderful. Um, as you walk in, uh, there's this huge uh, cauldron. Uh, it's about the size of a hood of a car. It probably weighs five or 600 pounds. And uh, it was captured by the colonials uh, during the battle. Um, and now has been hoisted on the rafters uh, just as you walk in to the tower. So it's really, uh, really something to see. New Hampshire is uh, represented. Uh, we have a monument there, of course, uh, which was in place at the, um, uh, during the, the bicentennial years. And uh, there is a statue of, uh, of General Stark. Uh, so sadly, uh, when I was there, uh, General Stark's sword uh, had disappeared, uh, whether it was due to vandalism or uh, some other factor, it's missing. And uh, I just didn't have the heart to publish a photo of the general without his sword. So like Elvis, he's, he's only filmed from the, the, the hips up here. Uh, but um, it's, it's a beautiful site. It's, um, you have Ethan Allen and the entranceway and then uh, General Stark uh, opposite him. Um, and it's a great, it's a great trip. Uh, and I would highly encourage everybody to make it and uh, to visit the Bennington Museum uh, where there's a lot of uh, artifacts from the battle on display. Uh, to include the, the cannon uh, that we see there. So just 
uh, recapping uh, his Revolutionary War career. Uh, we've talked uh, about Bennington. Um, John Andre, uh, as many of you history buffs may be aware, uh, was the British officer who convinced Benedict Arnold uh, to sell out West Point for 20,000 pounds sterling. Uh, Andre was uh, returning back to his ship, uh, perhaps appropriately named the Vulture, uh, sitting on the Hudson when he was apprehended and uh, the plans for the sellout um, were, were discovered. Uh, Benedict was able to make his way to the Vulture. Uh, sadly for the debonair, uh, the swab and the boner, Major Andre, uh, he found himself at the end of a noose and sitting on that court martial board was our very own uh, General Stark. Uh, Stark uh, served in the Northern Theater for the remainder of the war. Um, and as we saw in the FNI, <laughs> At the end of the war, uh, he returned to private life, uh, a true Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus, of course, uh, Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus, uh, the Roman emperor who was dictator, um, but at the end of his term gave up his powers and retired to his farm. And when invaders threatened his land, uh, he was called upon to lead the armies again, and he assumed the dictatorial powers. But at the end of the war, he gave them up and he returned to his farm. And uh, the same was true of our very own uh, General Stark. Um, the state motto, of course, uh, composed uh, during a toast uh, that he wrote uh, for his soldiers in 1809, unable uh, due to his um, rheumatism to, uh, to join them. And then as we see um, at his passing in 1822, he was uh, the last of, of the uh, the American Revolutionary War generals. So in remembering Stark, I just uh, came across this quote, which I think just was so absolutely um, appropriate. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that maybe um, you have a deeper understanding of uh, General Stark. Maybe um, we'll look at him in a different light. Um, as for me, I'm still on the journal of discovery. Um, I'm trying to reconcile where Stark stands in the pantheon of American heroes. And I've lately settled on a, um, a comparison to World War II. So when you look at World War II, when you look at like the top tier of generals, MacArthur, Eisenhower, Patton, Bradley, and then you look at you know, dare I say the second tier, secondary tier, like men like maybe Jimmy Doolittle or Ted Roosevelt, who won the Medal of Honor on, um, you know, the beaches of Normandy. And, and I think Stark would maybe uh, walk with Doolittle and Roosevelt, you know, the commander who led from the front, who was at the pointy end of the sword, uh, who was where the action was. And that's, kind of where um, I have Stark right now in my own mind. And um, I still um, remain very much the student and I still eagerly look forward to um, reading and uh, researching about him more because I just think he's an endlessly fascinating character. Um, I think there's much more we can learn from him. I think there's much more um, many more lessons uh, from his life, the way he lived his life and how he fought that, that we can learn from and, and apply uh, to contemporary society. And I will close with this uh, plug, uh, the Derry History Museum. Uh, open this Saturday from 12 to three, Wednesday night, six to eight, come on down. If you come on a Wednesday night though, be advised that that is when the junior historians meet there's about six to eight teenagers that come to the, the museum every Wednesday night, and they will be uh, draped around the museum and lounging out on the floor with research projects uh, spread out. They're a great, great bunch of kids. I love their energy. I love their vitality. I love that they're studying history. Yes, <laughs> great bunch of kids. Um, if you pop in, though, um, listen, I'm going to make a deal with you. Nobody else, nobody else knows this, okay? If you come in, I will let you hold the museum's flintlock rifle 
and wear a Tricon heart hat and take a selfie. All right. That doesn't get out to the Heritage <laughs> Commission. That stays here. Okay. <laughs> and um, we're looking to uh, open up um, more in the summer hours. So uh, watch our social media and, um, you know, we'll be, uh, you know, trying to get the museum open a lot more, but we have some great artifacts from Starco. You see over here, that's, um, we have a, you know, a, a, his autograph. The powder horn is from the French and Indian War. Uh, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful piece. And, uh, you know, we have a flintlock and some other artifacts. And uh, it's well worth the trip. If you haven't been to the museum for a while, it's been closed due to the pandemic. But we're open now. And um, we've got some great uh, volunteers helping us out. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, that uh, concludes uh, the project. If you want to give me a, a line, drop me a line or shoot me a text, please do. I don't, I'm not into um, Forex or any kind of uh, coins and I don't want to go in with you on a nail uh, parlor. Um, but <laughs> otherwise, if you want to talk history, please uh, give me a, give me a buzz. I, I do love that there's kids hanging out at the history museum. I can't yeah. think of a, a better place for kids to be maybe the library, but the history museum is really <laughs> close. No, it's a, it's a great, great group. And uh, they've been active. Um, She's a, a, just almost a, a year now. And um, I just, I just love them. They're just so much fun. Um, well, maybe if they spent more, you know, spent more time at the history museum, they wouldn't steal swords off of statues. Yeah. I'm not, uh, saying, not uh, telling you, Liz. Punk kids, but I'm thinking it was punk kids. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I, it might've been somebody just, you know, climbing on it and they broke it and they're embarrassed, you know? Um, <laughs> ho I, I, I don't think it was, you know, statues, some statues right now have been having somewhat of a rough time, but I, I don't think, and neither do the authorities in Vermont think that the, it was any kind of political motives and um, taking, you know, the sword away from. Oh, I didn't even think that. I just thought, again, uh, I, I say this as a former, you know, punk kid myself. I'm like, sometimes we just get in our heads to do dumb things. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've been there, done that myself. Okay. So there are some questions in Zoom. Oh, okay. Um, or not, in the chat in Zoom. All right. Um, someone asked, on the first slide, what does the green flag represent and why are the stars <laughs> tossed on there like a refrigerator? <laughs> yes. Ah, okay. So that is the flag of the, uh, the Green Mountain Boys. Uh, okay. So that's um, Ethan, Allen's, Ethan Allen's flag. And then uh, to the left, you have the Bennington flag, which current scholarship seems to think uh, did not, in fact, fly at Bennington. Um, it was made by Betsy Ross um, long after the battle had been fought. But the Bennington flag is on display at the Bennington Museum. Um, it's, it's huge. And uh, you go in uh, like a, a curtained, darkened room. It's a little vestibule. And it's there, you know, protected from the sun. And it's, it's magnificent to see it up in front, but I, I can't give you much background on the, on the Green Mountain Boys flag, um, but uh, that's a good one. You, you got me on there. So Liz, I'm gonna have to take a note. I think I got, um, somebody played Stump the Chump with me last time and I had to get back to you. So I will get back with you, uh, friendly caller, um, with, with more information. Thank you for asking the question. It's All a right. great, great question. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, uh, this is Ray, your friend, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull rank by interrupting, but uh, you were in Army Infantry, so you'd know more about this than I do, but both of us know what it is to have after action reports and lessons learned, and it's like going to the dentist without Novocaine. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I have noted that... Uh, John Stark was there at that attack at Ticonderoga, Fort Carrion in 1757, where the Black Watch, the 42nd Highlanders got slaughtered, frontal attack. And Lord Howe, George was killed, who was a great admirer of Rogers Rangers. And John Stark was also there at Bunker Hill, where though, the British eventually won. The Royal Marines still celebrate that as a core memorable date because of all the casualties they took. Yeah. 
they took their law. Well, like, they, yeah, they won. They won it. They said we can't take many more victories like this. Or right, right. We're not got any anyone left. And though John Stark, because he was on another mission and did not want to attack the Abenakis at St. Francis, he was well aware of his close friend, Robert Rogers from here in Derry and the attack. They attacked from three sides as then John Stark would do at Bennington. Not, not a frontal attack. We're not, we're gonna take them that way. Now I'm not an infantryman like you were, but it seems to me that this was a smart military man who learned from his past. If you have any comment on that, that's all. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Uh, I, I, I concur a hundred percent, you know, and, um, you know, I, it, it's funny. Uh, I, I just, a thought just occurred to me in, in the revolutionary war, you know, Robert Rogers, you know, went to the British as did John Stark's uh, brother, yeah. brother, William. And, uh, William was later killed, maybe thrown from his horse. We're not sure. Uh, but upon hearing of William's death, John said, that's the best decision that guy's ever made, <laughs> you know, but uh, a hard man. And uh, but one, I think uh, to capitalize on your point, uh, Ray, yeah, he did learn and he did take those things forward. And, and we as Americans uh, are all the better for it uh, because um, he knew that, that the militia, he could not lead them into the mouth of the defense you know he had to he had to come up with a novel plan uh which as you as so astutely pointed out was attack him from three directions at once and stark put himself at the decisive point of the battlefield um and he put himself at the toughest nut to crack and i think that's probably you know the other lesson learned you know is you have to be at the decisive point of the battlefield um, to ensure, you know, that, that victory is achieved. And I think it was, you know, the tactics and the leadership, you know, be at the decisive point, the battlefield that, that carried the day um, and, uh, and, and resulted in that, in that famous victory. Uh, there is another comment in the chat. Uh, this one says, great lecture, but Lafayette was the last surviving general in the Continental Army. Yes, I, I, would, um, I would concede the point. <laughs> Maybe I should have prefaced it by saying American uh, oh, Revolutionary okay. General, but um, touche. <laughs> no, that's great. That's a great point. That's okay. a great point. Thanks for bringing that up. All righty. Um, trying to go down the track. Are General Stark statues and monuments safe from being canceled like others in today's climate? <laughs> well, I... I fear, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, who freed a race and welded a nation back together again, um, was going to be canceled in San Francisco, uh, because in 1861, um, Sioux warriors outraged and rightfully so at the terrible uh, treatment they were receiving at the hands of the Indian Bureau, uh, rebelled and went on a raid. 120 of them were captured. Um, 110 of them were pardoned, but 10 were sent to the gallows. And Abraham Lincoln, you know, made the decision as commander of chief, you know, that this execution had to stand. And uh, there is, um, a movement out there, you know, to cancel Lincoln because of that decision. Um, so uh, General Stark's interactions uh, with the First Nation, the Native Americans, I mean, you saw the, the heartfelt friendship he had with Christo and his youth. Uh, as Ray indicated in his comment, Stark did not take uh, part in the raid on the village where he was captured and imprisoned. He, he did not, he, he, he refused to go. He, he would not harm uh, the people in the village. Uh, but nevertheless, um, he, he brought terrible warfare, you know, on, on the Abenakis. 
And, um, and thus, um, in, in the political climate today, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I, I couldn't say with any certainty that, that, that he would be free from the fray, if you will. And while the authorities in Vermont uh, believe that the vandalism to the statue is not politically motivated, you know, who, who knows? But um, yeah, it's um, <laughs> very interesting uh, times we live in <laughs> with regards to history and interpretation. And um, uh, yeah, <laughs> great question. Great question. It, thanks, it thanks reinforces it my opinion that the internet was a mistake and never a good place to discuss anything. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think the internet's great, but I think what's bad about it is anonymity. If you know you're going to say something really wild and crazy, put your name underneath it and stand it. You know, stand behind it. You know, when you can sit in your mom's basement, you know, uh, Google forty four and say some really crazy stuff. You know, I think it just, you know, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> there is another question in the chat. Could you talk about John Stark Park and the other landmarks? Because there are a few comments in here about like you know um, that were discussed. Uh, William Stark being a loyalist. What were those family dinners like? Why did they just not happen afterwards? Boy, they couldn't. He was thrown off his horse. Yeah, yeah. No, William William was killed. Um, probably thrown off his horse. It was later in the war, too. Uh, I think it was 1780. Um, I was heartened. Um, some uh, Just a couple of years back, um, a group of citizens in Manchester uh, decided that the Stock Memorial... Uh, was too important <laughs> to the town or to the city and its heritage to be left um, solely in the hands of the town, um, you know, politicians. And they took it upon themselves um, to uh, develop a friends group and restore the park. And um, they did a fantastic job. And what the work that was really outstanding was there's a wrought iron fence uh, surrounding uh, the park. And um, it had fallen into disrepair and repairing wrought iron fence, you know, cold cast uh, is a lost art. Uh, there's only one uh, forge here in the Northeast Newburyport that still even knows how to do it. And they commissioned um, this, this outfit in Newburyport to come in and restore that fence, you know, to its original appearance, which was undertaken at a tremendous expense and tremendous uh, dedication to detail. And uh, just ha my hats off to that, that citizens group uh, who did that. And uh, they also took care of the landscaping. Um, you know, sadly, you know, in some urban challenge areas, sometimes parks are a magnet, um, you know, for, for crime and vandalism. And they did a lot of work to improve the lighting, uh, to cut back some of the brush, um, you know, which, you know, uh, invited you know, bad behavior, if you will. And uh, they just did a fantastic job. And um, that was accomplished, geez, maybe uh, not even four or five years ago. And it's, it's, it's great. It, it's absolutely uh, wonderful. Uh, Bennington, as I said, is, is a beautiful spot. Um, and uh, it's a great town. It's a fun town. It's a funky, you know, kind of Vermont town. The museum's right there. Robert Frost, um, another uh, denizen of Derry is buried in Bennington. Uh, the churchyard is just beautiful. Uh, the graveyard there. Uh, a lot of the fallen from the battle are buried there to include Hessians. Um, so it's a great, it's a great spot. Uh, uh, here in Derry, we have our roadside marker and our bobblehead and uh, our booze decanter. But we have the license plate. <laughs> Although in 2016, uh, there was a movement uh, people didn't like having that motto on their plate and they went to the legislature and they said, uh, uh, could we replace live free or die with scenic New Hampshire or give people the option to have scenic instead of live free or die. And that was shot down in flames. Thank God. How about we uh, combine them live free in or die in scenic New Hampshire? Yes. That, that Liz, uh, if you were here. <laughs> a good work around. <laughs> uh, so uh, Michael has a question. He's raised his hand. Um, Michael, Michael, good to see you, my friend. How are you? I think uh, you're on mute, Michael. Michael. There we go. Yep, yep. Uh, I want to start off by saying I'm a fan of the Dairy History Museum. 
Yay. And it's a long story <laughs> to say that I have two cans of beer in the <laughs> Allen B. Shepherd room. Okay, I tell that story in, in person to anybody who wants to hear it. Uh, but uh, I'm also a fan of the Mill Yard Museum and John Clayton. And I've been afraid to bring this up to him, but I'm asking you, TJ, after this presentation especially, I had respect for you before, but even more so. Uh, oh, can you go up. to the Mill Yard <laughs> Museum and there is a portrait of John Stark and it says, born in Londonderry. Moved to Dairy Field, could they put a little parentheses and say in present day Dairy? I just uh. don't feel London Dairy <laughs> deserves the credit for John Stark. I know it was technically okay. All right. But could you do that for me? Double I'll check take that before. on, Michael. I'll take that on. Go, go there first. <laughs> Maybe they changed it on their yeah. own because of somebody complaining. All right. No, there's been some my uh, name, but John Clayton won't remember my name. OK, there's actually, Michael, there's been some controversy with uh, the signs leading into town uh, because they say entering Derry uh, incorporated, you know, in what, 1842 or whatever. And it's like, well, we just celebrated our 300th anniversary. That's not 1842. Why doesn't it say 1719 on the signs? So, uh, uh, and there's a movement, heard, Michael. It's Wind growing. Wyndham has a sign that says settled, and Londonderry has a sign saying settled, and we should have a sign saying settled. I agree. But again, I, agree. I do not have your, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, gravitas, I'll use that word, <laughs> to get these things done. Okay. Gravitas so and TJ Coyne has too. never been uttered before, Michael. Uh, <laughs> And never will be again. <laughs> but I'll Thank pause you. there and simply say, <laughs> do you think that is something that is just a pet peeve or? No, I know I, the I, Mill Yard Museum is in Manchester, but okay, but they should get it right. I agree. I'm going to take it on. I've taken it on. Okay. As a Manchester on resident, list. I wholeheartedly support this change. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Also, uh, I, I have been to Stark Park. Uh, it is beautiful. Uh, definitely all the the, um, upkeep, the renovations, is that the right word, have been great. Also, shout out to the Stark Brewery. Um, <laughs> not a Woman fan after of, my own heart. God bless you. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a fan of that particular libation myself, but my other half, um, for his birthday last year, I did get, um, no, it was last year, 2020, I got him a couple of... Uh, how specials that they did. And he was a big fan. So oh, um, awesome. we do have one more question. It says what? Okay. Oh, and I lost it. Where is it? Sorry. What are the rules for when a business establishes under the name of a historical figure, such as the Molly Stark Tavern? And actually that kind of ties back to the Stark Brewery. Sort of. Hmm. Yeah, that's a darn good question. And I, I wonder what uh, the Jim Beam company did to, uh, to take Stark's image for their whiskey decanter. And um, I know typically, um, and I'm just, I'm really, um, I'm reaching out here, but I know uh, the estate of the family has um, something, some say, but there's also, I think, um, like anything that's 100 years older or copyrighted before 1920 is now in the public domain. So uh, I'm not sure um, if there are any legal experts <laughs> listening in, please feel <laughs> free to chime in. But I, I know um, uh, the 100 years is a significant uh, milestone vis-a-vis -vis legality and um, image appropriation. But I, I do think you know, taste uh, and decorum should have something to do with it. And uh, some things I just find gauche and uh, I'm not like a very pretentious head. person. Yes, <laughs> yeah. there's a Hannah Dustin bobblehead too, which uh, I just, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I'm getting old, Liz, getting old. <laughs> no, I, I think bobbleheads of historical figures are a little odd. I. I mean, you know, historical figures are complicated and it seems a little strange to reduce them to a bobblehead figure. 
Um, I, yeah, because I was going to say, I do know like now a days, if you want, to, there's life rights that you have to purchase to someone, but someone older, I do wonder if they fall into public domain or you do have to contact descendants, but I wonder if, I wonder if our lawyer, our director, who is a lawyer would know. Hmm. Interesting no, question. Been, no, it's been some great uh, questions and reflections. I thank you very much. Um, I know I wasn't going to be disappointed tonight, and I wasn't. I know. Well, thank you. Um, it looks like I've gotten a lot of thank yous. There are a couple. I think I saw another person saying that Stark Park is very nice, which yes, it is. I always, I always, as a Manchester resident, I always feel like I have to defend that place, the city, a lot, and I'm like, there's a lot of nice things here. No, and it, and it wasn't always true. And, um, and I think the transformation that took place just, geez, I was maybe just four or five years ago is just fantastic. And I'm so, so happy that it, it did happen. Yeah. Well, looks like, yeah, a bunch of thank yous. Uh, if anyone else has any other questions, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, may I chime in again? All right. Uh, once upon a time, uh, Diane, my wonderful wife, was celebrating a birthday. I think this was be right before COVID-19. And we went to Brattleboro, Vermont. Uh, and uh, on, we went to a couple museums, art museums, because she's an art person. And she said, well, where else would you like to go, Michael? And I said, well, I, I, I really don't want to go anywhere else, which was kind of a lot. I, and since I'm the truth sayer, I had to say the Be Battle of Bennington Monument. So we didn't go out of our way too much. Uh, and uh, it, was a, it was a nice day. We had a nice time. But uh, TJ, uh, Seth Warner gets all the credit. There's a little, little statue of John Stark compared to Seth Warner and a little plaque compared to the Green Mountain Boys. Mm -hmm. So I was slightly disappointed and I wouldn't want you to mislead anybody to go there expecting some giant statue with or without a sword, with or without a sword. Would you like to comment? <laughs> I totally ignored uh, the, the statue of that other individual and right, went right to John Stark. So. <laughs> I don't even think I saw it, to be absolutely honest with you. But uh, yeah, well, you know, we're on their their home turf. You know, I I don't know. I uh, I, I I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. it, was just, it was I did too. Day. But it did seem yeah. to me like John Stark was uh, an afterthought, literally <laughs> an afterthought. Well, yeah, but I I also know that uh, uh, New Hampshire. Um, is not overly generous, overly generous in its uh, historical commu commemorations. And I'm, you know, wondering, you know, yeah, well, I guess we'll have to put a statue there. You know, it's, what's the bare minimum we can get away with, you, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking that uh, there might've been some. Uh... We do have one more question before we go. We're getting right up to the minute. And that is okay. what is next on the schedule to commemorate Stark? I think it's a good final question. Yeah, I think, uh, I would look. I, I would go to the uh, web page of uh, the Fort at Number Four in Charleston, and uh, look for their muster day. It'll take place in in August, and uh, the fort uh, fills up with uh, reenactors and uh, people in period dress, and they commemorate uh, Stark and um, his provisioning of his troops there, and uh, getting ready to make the seventy mile march to Bennington from from Charleston. And it's just it was a great day. Uh, great knowledge. People just go out of their way to share their knowledge with you. It's a, it's a beautiful place to walk around and picnic. And uh, again, the staff is very, very helpful and great programs for the kids. So I, I would look for Stark Day at the Florida number four uh, coming up in August. Check out their website. You won't be disappointed. And by all means, if you haven't been to the museum for a while, come on down and we'll, we'll hook you up with our Flintlock and our Tricon hat. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, with that, I'm going to say thank you to TJ for an amazing presentation and discussion. And thank you to all of our participants for making the discussion so lively. Yes, indeed. I echo that 100%, Liz. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. Uh, I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to talk with you tonight. And it was a great conversation. Thanks a lot. Thank all you. Right.
Well, have a wonderful night, everybody. And hopefully we will see you either on Zoom or potentially, fingers crossed, in person. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Great. have a good night. All right, good night, Liz. Thank you, everybody. Night, night now.